1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 21, Then David came to 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They share, they shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You guys may be seated. Joel, pray with me one more time before we dive into God's word together. Lord, thank you again for bringing us here this morning. For whatever reason you have brought us here through this room, we ask and pray that you will open our hearts and help us to receive your word. Lord, we know that at times with so much um, knowledge that the world provides, at, at times we uh, overload our brains and our thoughts with those that are lifeless. We ask and pray that you help us to empty those so that we may fill ourselves with the truth of your word. Be with us today, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're taking notes, the title of today's message is Greed-Driven Culture versus Grace-Filled Culture. Greed-Driven Culture versus uh, Grace-Filled Culture. Friends, imagine with me that you've been working really hard at your job for the past 10 years. I know looking at those who are sitting here this morning, there are only a select few who have that privilege of having a career that's past 10 years. Yet imagine that a new hire who just graduated from college has been hired by the company, and the company decides to be very generous and grant equal pay to the new hire to the salary that you've worked so hard to build up for the past 10 years? How would you feel? Or suppose you spent the entire day cleaning your house. Your siblings did not help you. No one helped you. You did it all by yourself. Yet when your parents come home from work, they they give equal credit to each of your siblings for the work that they haven't done, the work that only you have done. If we're to be honest, friends, we all struggle with this concept of fairness, equality, don't we? When we feel entitled to be fairly rewarded or compensated for our work, yet when everyone receives the same amount, something doesn't sit right with us, right? Why is that? Suppose you worked 100 hours for your company this week, and someone worked one hour. Yet if you were to receive equal pay, how would that make you feel? If you were the one who worked for that one hour, you would be thankful, jackpot. But if you worked for 100 hours, you might have something to complain about. In today's passage, we come across a story that compares and contrasts a group that is driven by greed versus someone who cannot help but be gracious because he first received God's grace. Whether it's greed or grace, both have the power to drastically affect the culture of a group for better or for worse. But before we get there, let's back up a little bit and recap what's been going on in 1 Samuel. If you recall our time together two weeks ago, David and his men had just been excused in their inescapable battle against the Israelites. Yeah, you heard that right. David, who was anointed to be the next king of Israel, along with 600 other Israelites who followed him, were uh, were now in a situation where they were expected to fight alongside their greatest enemy, the Philistines, against 
their own people, the Israelites. Not the other way around. They're not joining forces with, their, with the Israelites to fight against the Philistines. They were now put in an is- inescapable situation where they were forced to join forces with the Philistines to fight against the Israelites. There was nothing that could have gotten David out of this situation. He couldn't run. He couldn't hide. Yet just when David thought there was no way out, God, as he always does, intervenes. By God's gracious providence, there was, they were now spared from doing the unthinkable and were commanded by King Achish to go back home, commanded by the king to return back to Ziklag, which was the town in the land of the Philistines where they called home for the past 16 months. I can just imagine the level of relief, excitement, as David and his men were traveling back home, hoping to now reunite with their family members. However, when they got home, they were not met with a warm welcome from their families, but instead they were met with the ruins and the aftermath of a recent raid. David and his men were so devastated that they wept and wept until they were too tired to weep anymore. Have you experienced that before? Where you cried so much that you couldn't cry any longer because you were so exhausted from crying. Thankfully, this tragic incident drove David to his knees in prayer, and God met with David in that time. God met with David when he was in great need. When David asked God what he should do, what's amazing is how God not only commanded David to pursue after whoever is responsible for this mess, but also God promised that they will surely overtake and rescue everyone and every possession that had been taken from him. Although David and his men had no idea who had taken their family captive, by God's incredible guidance, we saw two weeks ago that they were led to this Egyptian in the open country. And through this one man, they were able to find out that it was the Amalekites out of all people, the Amalekites who were responsible for all the mess. And just as God had promised, with the help of this Egyptian leading the way, David and his men were led to the Amalekite camp, and they were able to not only restore and rescue their wives and their children, but also they were able to restore all the livestock that the Amalekites had raided, not only from there, not only from them, but also from all the surrounding nations. It was indeed a complete victory and a complete rescue where no one was missing, no one was hurt. You see, this is a miracle because back in the day when a nation is raided, they would quickly sell off the people. They would quickly sell off the wives and the children into slavery so they could make profit. For them, whenever they would raid a nation, the people were possessions, property. Yet by God's Divine providence, no one was missing, no one was hurt, and to sweeten the deal even more, they were now bringing back home extra livestock, extra spoils, and extra profit that they did not expect. This is where today's story picks up. After a great victory against the Amalekites and a great rescue, David and his men come back to Brook Besor, where the 200 of their men were left behind. If you recall, these were the men who were too tired and too exhausted to go any further to join the others in battle. Look at me in verse 21. The great reunion. Then David came into the, then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David, who had been left at Brook Basor, and they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. When David came near to the people, he greeted them. Ever since David became a fugitive and lived in the cave of Adullam, more and more people began to join him in search for a better life, away from the poor and wicked leadership of King Saul. So at full force, David had 600 men. If you count the wives and the children, it's probably closer to 3,000 people. So 600 men, they did everything together. From living a life as a fugitive, to seeking refuge behind enemy lines in the land of the Philistines, where they're at right now in Ziklag, 
They did everything together. However, after a long journey back from Aphek, where the, all the armies of the Philistines initially gathered to fight the Israelites, and after all those days of weeping due to the loss of their wives and their children, out of the 600 men, 200 were too exhausted. It was a 100-mile journey back and forth from Aphek. So after traveling 100 miles by foot, they were too exhausted, although they were missing their wives and their children, too exhausted to fight alongside David and the 400 others looking for the Amalekites. Now this was a big deal, right? Because 200 out of 600, not really good with math, but that's a third. That's a third of the army. And for them to back out in the pursuit of the Amalekites meant that a third of their men were not participating against an already outnumbered, against already outmatched opponent. And although we're not told how long it took for David and the rest of the crew to locate the Amalekites and rescue and retrieve all who belonged to them, I could just only imagine how happy these 200 men were to not only reunite with the crew, but also to reunite with their families, right? Can you imagine if your family members have been taken captive? You never know if you're going to see them again, yet you see them returning to you. And so they were anxiously waiting, hoping that they would all return safely, hoping to reunite not only with the rest of the crew, but also hoping that they would reunite with their wives and their children who were taken captive. So as they look upon the horizon each day, waiting for people to come back, anxiously waiting, one day they, appear, they see what appeared to be a silhouette of a group of people. And at first, they were suspicious. Are they coming to raid us? Is it David and the men? But as they got closer and closer, they realized that it was indeed David and the rest of the crew, as well as their wives and their children. It was indeed a joyous reunion that calls for a great celebration. You can just imagine many unable to contain themselves but to run and throw themselves as fast as they could to greet and reunite with the loved ones with hugs and kisses. However, while all the joyous celebration was happening during this day, in the midst of the great reunion, we see two contrasting responses toward these 200 men. The first response can be seen in verse 22, where it was obvious that not everyone was happy during this reunion. And so it's as if while everyone is enjoying the moment, someone decides to stop the music and interrupt the party because something wasn't right. And they had something important to say. Look with me in verse 22. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they, the 200, did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoils that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and, his, and children and depart. The words that the writer of this book used, wicked and worthless fellows, were the exact same words that were used to describe Nabal. You guys remember Nabal in chapter 25? As well as the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, back in chapter 2. We see, even in English, they used similar words to describe worthless fellow, wickedness, worthless men. Now, whenever this word is used in the original language in the Old Testament, it actually refers to someone who was either against God or someone who was extra greedy. For example, although Hophni and Phinehas were priests who were given a role to lead others in worship, worshiping God, their greed in satisfying their own desires came first before obedience to God. You guys remember that story? Similarly, although Nabal was a very, very wealthy man, he was a very greedy man as he refused to provide for David and his troops when they were in great need. Instead of being generous to the needy, Nabal hurled insults at their request. So then we've got to ask, what did these men do that were so wicked and worthless? Why did the writer of 1 Samuel call out these people who had just gotten back from participating in this search and rescue mission with David as 
wicked and worthless. Why? I believe that's because at the core of who they were, they too, just like Nabal, just like Hophni and Phinehas, were driven by greed and self-interest. If you look at me in verse 22, although David was their leader, they had decided that it was only right to decide on behalf of everyone that only those who traveled with David, only the 400 who raided the Amalekites were allowed to have the portion of the spoil. To the 200 men who were too weak, too exhausted to go with them, sure, they could have their wives back, they could have their children back, but the spoils and the livestock that they have gained from the raid, no, that was off limits. Only for those who took part in the raid were entitled to the spoils. Why? Because they believe that it is only fair, it is only right, that those who put into hard work should be rewarded for their work rather than the spoils being distributed amongst everyone, especially to those who did no work and stayed behind and broke a sore. From a worldly perspective, they seem to have a reasonable and justifiable legitimate case or argument which perhaps many in this room would agree with, right? If you work to work 100 hours, And the person sitting next to you works one hour. And the boss says, let's divide it up equally. Some of us would be bothered. Basically, it's only fair and right that the 200 200 men and their family don't deserve any portion of the spoil because they didn't actively participate and contribute. Why split everything evenly to 600 households if it were to be, when if it could be split only amongst the 400, right? They would have so much more of the spoil. What's wrong with that? What's so wicked and worthless about that? Well, the reason behind why their thought or their plan or or their idea was so wicked is seen in verse 23. The reason behind why they were called wicked and worthless is because all of the spoils was not theirs to begin with. Look at me in verse 23. Verse 23 says, But David said to them, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us, and he has given into our hands the the band that came against us. Friends, as David points out, they didn't do anything to earn or deserve this. But instead, it was God. It was the Lord who has given the spoils to them. However, they had quickly forgotten about that detail. And the fact that it was God who preserved them, and that it was God who had given them Amalekites into their hands, friends, it was all God. The only reason they were able to survive against the Amalekites, the only reason they were able to retrieve their wives and their children, the only reason they had extra spoil that they could bring back home was because of God. Yet due to their greed, they've quickly become blind. So blind to God's provision. And has become so possessive with the things that never belonged to them in the first place. Thinking they actually have the authority to pick and choose who receives the spoils and who doesn't. Friends, I believe this, in essence, is at the heart heart of greed, isn't it? This never-ending pit of self-serving, self-loving, self-exalting, where everything belongs to yourself, And nothing is above your authority. And so because everything belongs to you, and because you deserve it all, there's no reason for you to share with others. It would be such a waste to share with those who don't deserve what belongs to you in the first place. Friends, if there's anyone here who struggles with greed, or you don't know that you struggle with greed because you have become so blind to it, I pray that through today's time, God will reveal to you so clearly, so blatantly, just how destructive and devastating it is. As we've been emphasizing over and over again throughout the book of 1 Samuel, God always provides a different perspective from the world. And he desires for us to see from 
his vantage point. You see, a greed-driven response is not our only option. The world tells us that it is our only, or perhaps it is the best option. Yet the scripture reminds us that a greed-driven response is not our only option. God also provides for us a better option, a grace-driven or a grace-filled response through an example of David. Let's start from verse 23 and read until verse 25. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers. With what the Lord has given us, he has preserved us and given into our hand a band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statue and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. Friends, right away, the glaring difference between David's response from the wicked was how David never credits himself for any of this. Right? Instead, if we closely compare and contrast verses 22 and 23, we see that the subject of each verb has changed. Whereas in verse 22, these wicked men credit themselves for everything, in verse 23, it is very clear. David saying, no, it was the Lord, it was the Lord, it was the Lord. Why? Because David was well aware that God's initial command and God's promise before they even went to the Amalekites, before they even went looking for those who took their families captive, David cried out to God in prayer. And through that time of prayer, David had great faith, not in his abilities, not, not in his strategies, but in God's promises alone. That God will preserve David and his men. That God will overthrow the enemies that come against them. That God will rescue their wives and their children. That God will provide. I believe this is why even, uh, David even allowed the 200 men to stay back and rest in Brook Basor. Because despite being outnumbered, despite being outmatched in every way, David trusted, hey, if God promised that we're going to be victorious, it doesn't even matter how many go with me. Even if I go by myself, God will rescue us. For David, this battle, as well as the outcome, always belonged to the sovereign Lord. David believed that the only reason they were able to win and be victorious was because God allowed them to be victorious. David believed this even from the very beginning. If you recall, when no one from Israel wanted to fight against the mighty warrior Goliath because they were too afraid, despite not having the proper armor, despite not being strong enough according to soldiers' standards, David was able to defeat Goliath. You guys remember that story? Why? Why was David able to defeat Goliath? Was, because, was it because he had a better weapon? Was it because he was faster than Dave, uh, Goliath? Friends, it's because David chose to trust in God and his promises rather than focusing on his own abilities. And so from that point on, David, having gone through countless encounters after encounters of God intervening in his life to provide, to protect, and to rescue, David knew better than anyone else that it was indeed foolish to give any credit to anyone else but to God and God alone. Friends, once you place God at the center of your life and dethrone yourself, from the throne that never belonged to you in the first place, you begin to see what God sees. You begin to see clearly. And so while the greedy men were busy crediting themselves, David knew that this victory, this rescue of their wives and their children, and all the spoil was only possible because God was gracious towards them. No other reason. Unlike the wicked and worthless men who were driven by greed and only care for themselves, David could not help but to acknowledge that it was all grace, that it was all God. It was God who preserved them. It was God who granted them victory. It was God who provided them with all the spoil 
not only for the 400 who participated, but also the 200 that had to stay behind with the baggage. We see very clearly, right? The 200, they weren't just hanging out and not doing anything. They were actually taking care of the bags of the 400 men so that they can be light on their feet, traveling to defeat the Amalekites. And so because the spoils belong to the Lord in the first place, and because, the, because everyone has participated and contributed in some way, they shall all be shared equ equally. Not according to man's standards, not according to the world's standards, but according to God's standards. What's even more incredible in David's response is how despite the wicked and worthless men trying to separate themselves from others as though they, they are the ones who deserve the spoils, David quickly gets rid of that distinction, doesn't he? If David really wanted to as the leader of Israel, what could he do? If he really wanted to, he could have dismissed those wicked and worthless fellows and not include them in the victory as well as sharing of the spoils. Listen, how dare you think that these spoils belong to you? I will discipline you by distinguishing. You do not get any of the spoils as a punishment. It will only be distributed amongst those who are not as wicked and worthless as you. David could have done that. However, although the writer of this book calls these men wicked and worthless, what does David refer to them as? We see in verse 23, David does not refer to them as worthless and wicked, but instead, we see in verse 23 that David refers to them as my brothers. As someone who has experienced God's grace over and over again in, their life, in his life, David would have realized that apart from God's grace, if it wasn't for God's grace, he too is just like them wicked and worthless. We see examples of what kind of a man David could become apart from God. Yet because David first received God's grace in his life, he is also able to, gracious, to be gracious towards those around him as well. Friends, you and I, we live in a world where without God we have the propensity to become just like these wicked and worthless fellows in today's passage. Where we become so overwhelmed with our greed that we become blind to who God is and all of his workings in our lives. And as the greed begins to grow in our lives, we desire to be the ultimate authority to determine what is fair and what is not rather than allowing God and God alone to be the sovereign judge. And so when we come across passages that don't necessarily align with what we think is fair, with what we think is just, we choose not to believe. We choose not to accept. Or even worse, we tend to pick and choose and tweak passages to fit to our liking. Friends, instead of living this greed, living in this greed-driven culture, we ought to cultivate a grace-filled culture. And that starts with the correct understanding of God's word. As we can see in today's passage, although it seemed unfair to the wicked and worthless fellows to share their spoils that they worked so hard for to everyone else, David was able to see it from a different angle. You see, grace is not about fairness. Grace was never about fairness. If you want to talk about fairness, we all should receive what we deserve, which is death and punishment for our sins. However, grace isn't fair. Grace isn't fair because Jesus, on our behalf, has taken the punishment for all our sin, and in return, what does he do? He clothes us in righteousness. You want to talk about fairness? How is that in any way fair? 
Yet the Bible overflows with stories after stories regarding God's grace. Not so that we can take a good hard look at it and say, no, thank you, I'll pass. But so that we can be transformed by it. As someone who has not only encountered God's grace firsthand, but as people who are being transformed by his grace as a church who extends God's grace towards one another, forming this grace-filled culture, not only in the church, but in our workplaces, in our families, in our neighborhoods. Friends, from God's perspective, if he were to treat us fairly for what we've done or what we haven't done, oh boy, we can run. (laughs) We can try to hide, we're in big trouble. Yet Paul reminds us in Romans 5, 8, by his grace, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that fair? Church, may we strive to develop this culture of grace rather than a toxic culture of greed where we acknowledge that you and I belong to God, where we acknowledge that when God blesses us with something, it's not so we can boast about it, so that we can sh- but it's so that we can share it with those around us. If everyone had this grace-filled mindset in the church today, no one would be struggling financially. Yeah, isn't it so blatantly obvious even in our church today that those who have much think they earned it. When in reality, God has given it much so they can be good stewards with what they were given. For the past two weeks, I was in school in Louisville. And one of the topics we discussed in class, and it got really heated, was regarding spiritual abuse. That's the hot topic these days, right? Spiritual abuse. The amount, of abu- the amount of abuse that goes on in the church today, both from the pastors and the leaders, as well as the members, and at the heart of it, I think it has a lot to do with this very issue here that we're talking about today. Thinking that the church and ministry belongs to us. Thinking that we are the one building the church thinking that we are actually doing the church a favor by protecting the church, serving the church, loving the church. Yet when the church doesn't abide to our liking, we look for another church, a better church, a better pastor. Friends, I don't think that's the solution. I think the solution is to humbly acknowledge before God our weaknesses and depend upon God's grace to cover our weaknesses, to offer our church with open hands to God and ask him to lead and guide the church. As many of you know, a church these days have such a bad reputation, right? Moral failures, abuse, greed, we can go down the list. Rather than pointing fingers and trying to determine who we ought to blame for everything, who is the victim, who is the victimizer, no. I believe God desires for us to learn from David, as he says in verse 23, my brothers, my sisters, my family. As people who have been touched and transformed by God's grace, may we extend that grace towards one another. And through that, my prayer for our church and for all the churches is for us to overflow with this amazing grace that God has poured upon each and every one of us. I put up this picture up. As I was thinking about this picture, I realized more often than not, we think the church ought to be more like the picture on the left, where we are gathering people to the church to form a Christ-centered church. But in reality, I think the church should be more like the picture on the right, where we don't go near the center because Christ deserves all the praise, honor, and glory. We simply aim to worship him 
and abide his commands rather than expecting God to bless our church and our agendas and our goals. I pray that our church will never become a church where it is people-centered, where it is people-pleasing, but only a church that exists to glorify our God. Let's pray together.